Welcome to the Wonder Podcast. This is your host, CCB, and today's conversation is one of our Wonder Grant recipient teams from 2023. And I'm delighted to have these two folks from Taylor Design join us, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves. But first, I want to say, for anyone who's not familiar with the Wonder Grant, it is we're in our fifth year of hosting this program at one workplace. And what we do is offer financial grants to design firms who are doing work to advance thinking, insights, research, and solutions for human interaction with the built environment. That's a very broad term. And so we drop it down each year into a theme. And last year's theme, which we're talking about right now, is what improvements might we suggest for well-being for people in the built environment? And that crosses corporate environments, healthcare environments, learning environments. And Taylor Design has a very interesting set of research and solutions that they're going to share with you. So I'm going to say, welcome Thank to you. the Wonder Podcast. Who wants to introduce themselves first? Sure. I, CCB1, it's, it's great to be here. I think we're really Aaron and I, and on behalf of Taylor Design and Eric, who's not here today, we're super excited to be one on the podcast, but I think most importantly, had a chance to do this research, especially just just given how kind of interesting it is in the healthcare world and that it's public and really important to us in, in that respect. So one, my name, sorry to introduce myself first, but my name is Elliot Wortham. Um, at Taylor Design, I'm relatively new. I'm uh, our director of strategy and experience design and lead up what we sort of call our design strategy team here. And my background has been in healthcare. I'm not an architect, uh, in case anybody is wondering. Um, I've got a master's in health administration and a master's in interaction design. And I've been on the service, experience, and strategy design part of the healthcare world for I don't know, a little over 10 years now, places like uh, Cleveland Clinic and a couple other like larger health systems and have been really honored to be a part of the Taylor Design team. So Excellent. Now I'm going to say welcome to Aaron. And I'm going to give a caveat here. Aaron has very kindly joined us after, at the tail end of a, a kind of a monster cold. So we're going to cut him a lot of slack and and use every word as effectively as possible. Thank Aaron, you. why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Aaron McKenzie, and I'm a senior design strategist at Taylor Design, uh, where I've been for the last six years working almost exclusively with healthcare clients, ranging from really large academic medical centers down to community-based nutrition organizations to Nobel laureates. It's been a really interesting period of life. I, too, am not an architect. My background, similar to Elliot's, is in interaction design. So for both of us entering into the space of thinking about and designing for the built environment with the frameworks of digital interactivity, best practices from the technology sector affords us a really interesting lens to examine where we are currently and where we might be going. As you mentioned, CCB, we both work at Taylor Design and Taylor Design is a 100% employee owned firm that firmly believes that great design can empower people to be and do their best. Uh, with offices, staff, and clients across California. Our practice delivers architecture, interior design, medical planning, lab planning, and design strategy, which is us, to a wide range of clients in the healthcare, science, and technology, higher education, and senior living sectors. Elliot and I do most of our work in the healthcare space. We're kind of healthcare design geeks, which is a fun club to be in. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to stop you for one second and go back to Elliot and say, Elliot, Tell us the third member, the third you know uh, member of your team that was not able to join us today, but we want to give him a shout out. Yeah, I mean, I a big shout out. Eric Peabody is a principal at Taylor Design. I'd say architect, analytic, even like healthcare strategy guru, and he's sort of a brilliant person and a really down to earth guy. Couldn't make it today, but has been a part of this research as we've kind of chugged along, and. Yeah, he's he's been great. Perfect. And um, this it will remind me to tell all of our listeners that on the Wonder Grant page, 
there is a section for tailored design in this particular research, and you'll be able to find the full research report. You'll be able to find the podcast. You'll be able to find links to all of the, the folks so that you'll be able to make more connections should you like to do that. Okay, so we got you here. There's a big healthcare umbrella around this research. And tell us, like, what's the topic? Why this topic? What made this time and, and this kind of content relevant for you all? Aaron, do you want, do you want me to take that one first? Yeah, no, dive right in, Elliot. Yeah, I mean, I this topic is fascinating for many reasons. And I think for us, for us, one, it's a major sort of shift in the healthcare world that is, is not necessarily that new, but is becoming very new because of reimbursement strategies and people thinking about moving inpatient care, what traditionally was inpatient care to home, which has been really fascinating around, you know, at least the United States. So there's a couple for us, the topic of thinking about the experience of care delivery in a new way. And especially as we think about, well, the physical space is now from a hospital setting to a home setting. And what does that mean for, what does that mean for providers? What does that mean for patients now having medical equipment in their home? You know, our, our lens of experience is, is changing and will continue to change maybe in unexpected ways. And so for us, we, we really, one, wanted to think about the physical space as it relates to people's homes. And, and you'll see probably in the research, some of that's there and some of it's more experience related. Two, Aaron mentioned this earlier, but we both get, and, and our team gets really excited about thinking about the experience of care as it's delivered, whether that be you know agnostic to space or whether that be thinking about how people touch technology or like, do they need to go to the bathroom, right? So things like that. And number three is we, we're big on exploring new research methods. So it, if you do, you know, hopefully the report doesn't put you to sleep, but if you read the, you know, 50 some pages, we've got, we, we took a different approach to a sort of a research methodology from thinking about how we can show people things and make it more tangible for folks and get feedback on those tangible aspects of care delivery so that we can really kind of dive deeper into insights that we might not get another way. Excellent. So I will just give you all a heads up. It's only 56 pages. Don't get you know, cowed by the, <laughs> the, the prospective tome that you may have to manage through because it's a report that you are going to want to download and spend a little bit more time in. You talked about kind of what did you hope to accomplish from the perspective of collecting information, but talk us through kind of the the methodology that you deployed to get at this research. And the reason why I'm asking you that specifically is because you do some good journey mapping that carries across patient and provider. Yeah. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, I'll take this one. Well, like nearly all of our research, we begin with kind of a robust secondary exploration, a scan of what assets are available published and written about and, and what can we get our hands on that begins to frame the, for us, it was the world of hospital at home care, thinking about it operationally. What are the logistics involved for healthcare providers as they, as they seek to this, there's regulatory considerations that occurred because of COVID there's precedent thinking about history. So we're trying to map the ecosystem of hospital at home care so that we have a firm footing for things that come next. With that foundation, we begin to map what we have come to understand as the experiences for both the patient and the provider. Uh, and in that mapping, we start to see the areas of opportunity for design intervention or conceptual intervention. You know, what are the pain points and what are the challenges and where might we as designers with our particular niche invest ourselves or where are the deltas? What are the places that we're not finding resources available to learn more about? And maybe it's a good chance for us to stick our nose in there and figure out what, what comes of that. So we have this kind of foundational body of research and we've created maps, visually visual maps, which are contained within the report. And from those maps, we go deep again. So we start to really understand that experience of care and, and 
for the purposes of this report, we really honed in on the experience of care for providers in and around the patient's home. So we start at that point to say like, well, what if we were to try to improve that state? So we created concepts. And with these concepts, they were brought to a level of fidelity where we could tell a story about some ideal future state. We were playing around with mid-journey AI image creation to, to create rich visuals that helped tell a convincing story about a suite of services or products within this concept. And we were then able to re-engage a series of, of industry experts with whom we had spoken to during our first round of research. We re-engaged them and said, hey, in the future, if your providers are made available these ideas, what do you think? Are you comfortable with that? We're not testing ideas that we think are necessarily world changing. They don't they might not even be great ideas, but simply by by putting forth provocations out into the universe to test what the future might look like, we learn a lot more about what's possible because we're we're prototyping kind of in the scientific method rather than just compiling a research report and pushing it over over the publication line. First off, I want to say everyone you know, that's listening, everyone who is, who is a member of our ecosystem of people in different places starts with people. And all of us have challenges, health challenges as, you know, as they, as we progress through life, all of us and all of our family members. So when I think about who the research might be interesting to, and that's part of my job to say, oh, you know, if, if, if this group is more interested, you might want to listen to this particular podcast or read this report. And it, this one struck me that everyone will be interested in it because yeah. everyone has these challenges. It's not a, it is about healthcare and it takes the provider's perspective and, you know, kind of moves forth certain recommendations or potential concepts that yeah. support the delivery to every single one of us. So it's it has a very rich engagement mm -hmm. because of who would be benefiting from whatever these suggestions are. Not only the providers, because you're making their job a little bit easier. But I thought you had an interesting, simple graph that talked about the benefits and the drawbacks of healthcare at home. And you talked about the benefits are, you know, pretty simple, happier patients, lower costs and quality of care. But then I wanted to say, wait a minute, quality of care. Where did that cross over in the drawbacks? And there's that uncertainty that comes about from who the, the folks are that are delivering it and how what the delivery system is, um, geographic constraints and recruitment and retention. So I thought those were really pretty powerful bites to stop and say, wait a minute. Yeah. Well, Aaron, maybe I'll take the quality of care one. <laughs> I think you just had a conversation with some folks also that kind of talk about the. Yeah. The I mean, I wish, I wish, I wish we had more time. Sometimes that means time and money, right. To dive into some of those topics you just mentioned CCB, because to your point, we, we, Touched a little on quality of care. I think there's a lot of open questions here. Like we are by no means hospital and home experts necessarily on after after this report, right? But but well, by any means. I think what's so fascinating though is that it seems in this total sort of environment, that question is still being asked. So for instance, some colleagues of mine I was talking to from previous previous worlds were saying, well, actually, you know, we're working on hospital at home programs. They are working with a, a contracting agency to come in people's homes, but does that mean I'm getting the same level of care that I would get if I, you know, if I got it from the hospital system building it on its own? So there's these, there's the really interesting sort of perspective, which we did not dive into in this report on different, different ways these care models are being developed for different types of, uh, let's say, providers or other types of folks coming in and out of people's homes. So we can't necessarily talk on the quality of care in that aspect, but people are working on it for sure because you want it to be the same quality of care. Now, on the experience side, you also want the experience to be really good. So though we didn't dive really deep into 
patient experience, even at least on the provider side, you know, for instance, some of the folks we talked to were like, I don't know if I want to walk into some people's homes, you know, in this way or that way, or, you know, am I going to make them uncomfortable or, you know, is, is it the right environment to be going into? Do they want me there? You know, those types of questions, I think are the stories that we got really excited about because there's a lot of research, like you just mentioned CCB out there, that's public on this being good for patients. And we've been saying, well, wait a second, is this also good for providers or how will it be? That's sort of why recruitment retention gets brought up. You know, geographic constraints gets brought up quite a bit because it's just logistically complicated to do some of this work and actually might even be more expensive than what we do today. You know, you clearly are vocal about where you are relative to the research. I mean, this is, you are taking, you know, stabs at a developing right. tool. And right. so mm-hmm. nobody's going to hold you to like, did you answer all those questions? It right. was more of the, I thought it was very interesting to like take that framework and then look at the journey and you have the patient journey and the provider journey. And yes, clearly say we we looked at the provider journey mm-hmm. and in a way, you know, you have to start with one or the other, mm-hmm. you, know, so, you know, you can't do everything at the same time. So, so that's very clear in your report and in the way that you're describing all of the work. So I think you're utilizing the same set of experiential milestones, but you're just talking about, well, so from the provider perspective, yeah, what happens? Right. And I, I think, and Aaron and I were just talking about this earlier. I, you know, we, the time we were doing this research, there's not a lot of public information about the provider side of this equation. And that's that's one of the things we are hoping comes out of some of this is that we're, we're trying to shed a little bit more light on that's really important, especially in a time when we've got nurse retention issues and a massively overstressed healthcare you know, employee population. And it seems remiss if we keep developing, if, if folks who are developing hospital home programs, and that, not to saying this is true, but if they miss miss the opportunity to create a well sort of well-being in the workforce when a new model of care is being developed if that makes sense i'll layer onto that that potential growth for hospital home is unknown i think a lot of folks are really excited about the ability to to move services away from the hospital hospitals are really expensive to build and maintain and staff and wow if you could shift five percent of that patient volume into their own home we we might achieve real value for the patients who do need to be there and that's wonderful it's complicated. It's really complicated, as as you pointed out in our drawbacks section, you know, and there's realities associated with where are you providing care and what kind of broadband internet access do your patients have? Yeah. All of these considerations. But the, the one for the for the providers is if this growth takes place at the scale that it very well might, you know, if we look at the shift for remote work due to COVID as an example, like Overnight, we, we shifted modes of work. Okay, let's say that happens. You, we, we are going to be faced with a whole generation or a whole community of providers that are creating new norms of where and how care is provided for patients, but also how do they do their work? Where do they go to the bathroom when they're out in community providing care? How do they account for lost time when they're driving from patient to patient? You know, these are the kinds of considerations that when we when we were looking at, do we think about patients or do we think about providers? There was a lot of interesting stuff about patients and there was not much about providers or some, but not much, as Elliot noted. And within that, some of these nuts and bolts, experiential pieces, you know, CCB, as you pointed to these kind of humanistic, like, where do I go to the bathroom becomes really critical. And we need to like explore that space and say, whoa, 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 if we're going to really invest in this system of care, those things cannot be late to the game. They need to be at the fore so that you have staff who are happy and rested and yes, even comfortable when they walk into someone's home to provide care, right? It's a great, it's a great reminder, if I could say this really fast, because, and you could tell, sorry, CCB, we get excited about this topic, but, you know, it's a great uh, my dad is retired now, but it was a retired eye doctor. Okay. And I remember these times, I'm just think, just bear with me here for a second, where we would sit in the car and he would dictate why I would drive home from picking me up for school all, all the time. Right. And I'm just sitting there like, I don't know what he's talking about on the phone. But what's interesting is multiply that by a hundred, 
you know, and without the systems in place. And is that a really good provider experience, given that now we're going to be driving all over the place, potentially? That's yeah. I mean, it's just a fascinating world we're entering into. It, it truly is. And this is where I'm going to give the plug again to say, download the report. It's going to fascinate you beyond belief. But you guys have taken us to the place which gets us to kind of your future provider experience concepts. So you came up with a number of concepts and some of them, I gave you high marks for innovation earlier in this conversation, just like, wow, I merging what is possible with what might be possible. You did some pretty, pretty fascinating work. So how about if you take us through the concepts, however deeply you'd like to. You want to you want to start or you want me to? I'll let Dobby start. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think we we touched on this a little. We we you'll see in the report we picked sort of a couple pain points that we observed and projected out a little bit in a sort of speculative way, which isn't always exactly what we do in our experience design work when we're helping design new experiences for today. But for the purpose of this research report, we wanted to get people's sort of first blush opinions on different concepts. So. One concept we have, in the, which you'll see in the report, was really about, which we call well drive, was a thought on how do you solve sort of the complexities of logistics. And it's about sort of autonomous and on-demand transportation for, for hospital and home providers. And actually, that, that had more to do with well, what happens when people are driving around and are they going to be collaborative and how are they going to work together? So you're imagining like pathways in the hallway when you're in a hospital you know, nurses and other providers are talking to each other. How can you replicate that in a nomadic sort of world? And that was a speculation on autonomous vehicles. And if that indeed becomes more prolific, are people then being picked up and being able to do work while they're in a car? Can they talk to each other? Can they collaborate? Things like that. The second one we got kind of excited about and we're really interested to hear people's opinions on was called Included Health. These are all obviously fake names for the purposes of getting feedback, which was about transportation of equipment, providers being sort of being able to easily deliver on-demand efficient medical equipment. Now, this has been a problem in the healthcare system for since the dawn of time, you know, is, is the efficiency of equipment delivery and all that good stuff. And we're saying, well, what if you piggyback that with a company like Amazon and you're able to get things as efficiently as that happens? And that concept was fascinating to get feedback on. We can get into it if we want to in a little more detail, but it was, you know, I think Aaron and I had assumptions that people won't like Amazon doing things like that in the future. And that nest, that wasn't the case after all. Almost everyone we talked to was like, great, have them do that. You know, I can't even imagine why they wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like- it. For all, for, you know, I'm, it's more complex, obviously, right? But like, yep. oh, go ahead, Aaron. All right, I figured I'll pick up the last two. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. The first two were really about logistics and transportation, kind of solving solving for how, how do we get places and what happens while we're getting there. And the, the second two really kind of come back to that core thing of like, where do I go to the bathroom? Or what are the what are the spaces that may be provided out in the community that replicate the physician's lounge or the hallway or the break room or the bathroom. The third concept we produced, we were calling Medi, and it is a series of storefronts that are built out out in the community that function as kind of remote physicians' lounges, and and they they then also become an investment in that community. But it, it relies upon a certain density of providers within a geographic region to come and use it. And some of the feedback we got on that was like, if there's two people in there, I'm not going to go. So it was one of those ideas that was a little, the reception was a little more flat than we may have anticipated. And in that response, we learned a ton about like the need for critical mass of people in a space to really serve a purpose for socialization or collaboration. Our final concept is called Haven and it, it takes the idea of Medi, which are these lounges, but it, it becomes more networked. So in this scenario, we were saying that local businesses could join part of a consortium or a constellation of, of available spaces, bathrooms, lockers for pickup, but they they tag themselves as available pro- providers. And perhaps there's a way that 
you know, peers can leave reviews around the cleanliness of the bathroom or the quality of the coffee. And so that, so for providers who are going out in the community, they have the assurance and the confidence that the spaces that they need to do their work outside of clinical care are available to them and are reliable. You know, really, really reinforcing that consistency outside of care is a fundamental need for for these these physicians and nurses and, and folks. So, so those are the four concepts that we developed to test uh, with, I, with our experts. I think what's so, what's so, at least for us as like an inquiry, there's like, a, there's an interesting thread that goes through all these. And it's essentially that, you know, one, of course, it's about provider experience, but two, it's where our sort of architectural worlds and technology worlds and people and service delivery meet. And that's why all of these are a little different, you know, and and also that they, you know, kind of consider a breadth of ecosystem. And I know, CCB, you were mentioning that a little earlier today, which is how do we think of solutions holistically, you know, in the future? So, well, I would step back again and say the the elephant that you decided to tackle is a, is a very very large challenge, and so to start to start developing concepts to allow people to interact with feedback, you know, just consider you, you did some fairly robust conversations. And I wondered in all those conversations, what was the most surprising thing you heard? Elliot came back and said, you're not going to believe this, but, and Aaron said, I heard. Well, I mean, maybe I could start off as we, we were really fortunate in, in being able to engage with a really wide range of, of professionals. And one of whom was a medical provider from a really rural setting. And her assessment of the autonomous vehicles, for instance, was just a deep abiding discomfort. It was around where I'm from. You know, I've taken, her her story was that she's taken an Uber once when she went to a conference. It it just really highlighted that the, that the, 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 the specific considerations of where care is provided and the community of providers that do that care will super influence what the right fit is. You know, Elliot was mentioning before being in conversation with different folks who are trying to get hospital home up and running. And it's certainly not a one size fit all solution. And as technology and services roll out, there's going to be need to be a great deal of consideration around is that service in fact appropriate for the people who deliver the care, not just for the care that needs to take place. So I thought that was a really, really fascinating response. Yeah, I agree. I totally, I totally agree with Aaron. I also, I, there are a lot of surprising things to it. You know, after people give you feedback, you're always like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Just out of curiosity. And then people, I, just like Aaron said, they're like, I don't, I don't know if I don't want to be in a driver's vehicle, especially not right now. And we live in near San Francisco, right? And there's all sorts of issues right now with the crews and others, but you know, for for me, I don't know if this is necessarily surprising, but it is reinforcing, which is that man, the workforce crisis in healthcare is is a is a tough one, and it's full of complexity and uh, diversity challenges, and you know, well being challenges, and it's it our workplace is shifting from a place to a hybrid place, you know, and and it's a it's time to pay attention to it more than we more than we have. And I, that's not a new story necessarily, but it does say it feels like after COVID, you know, that was everybody's paying attention and it sort of subsided. And now we're just, this was an interesting reminder to say, oh, wow, <laughs> we, we are, now more than ever is the time to focus. And that, that to me is, is really. It's interesting to look at, you know, there's all sorts of data in your report and there's all sorts of research references so that you if you had the interest in going down a rabbit hole you could actually do that one could but the the nature of people left the workplace and we learned how that you actually could work remotely and technology needed to catch up and we needed to understand different behavior requirements in healthcare when they closed down hospitals and you couldn't get your resources your healthcare resources because they were filled with covid patients and and providers and insurance companies figured out ways that, you know, remote conversations could take place and tele telehealth and telemedicine got a little bit more robust. And there was there was movement, if you will. In in to your point, 
people's experiences and ability to accept because now you actually have done some of these things. And yes, people are going to feel one way or the other, you know, as they move along that experiential curve. However, I think nothing happens unless people try things. You know, we, you're, we had like a leverage point, you know, a tipping point, if you will, to go, oh, well, you could try this now. So, so it's amazing, amazingly fascinating and informational research that you all have done. And the concepts will make people think without a doubt. I want to know what y'all are going to do with this with, at Taylor moving forward. Do you just finish this little report and put it away in a filing cabinet or an archive folder? What? Yeah, exactly, actually. You know, I think I think for us, it's a great starting place, especially as we think about our own health design studio and as we think about the health-related projects that Taylor Design focuses on. We've already seen it be really helpful as we've got some of the folks say like Eric, who's not here today, working on master planning projects with health systems as we help influence and use extra research to think about big trends in, in hospital and home care, um, which as you know, these projects can be you know planning for 30 years out. So this is the right time to be doing that in a, in a really interesting you know, use case. I mean, we're hoping this helps us you know, explore more conversations with folks folks like you all and others who, who are really kind of diving deep into the experience of care for hospital at home patients and, you know, contribute to a body of knowledge or at least the beginning of one, you know, that is more accessible. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, I think, why Excellent. we're so excited that it's public, at least. And, well, we're excited as well. And I understand you actually have submitted it for some potential conversations in broader bodies or conferences, which is fantastic and does exactly what we always want the Wonder Grant to do, move y'all forward and, you know, take concepts and design ideas for experience and or space to go, what else can we do? So I'm going to say thank you very much, Aaron and Elliot from Taylor Design for joining us on the Wonder Podcast, repeating to all of our listeners that you can find all of this information on the Wonder Grant page uh, for Taylor Design and know that your Wonder Podcast is available on all streaming services. <laughs> so look for it, like it, and uh, listen to as many of them as you possibly can. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.